We are indeed live. Yes, hey. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this Sunday conversation yes. with the commissary hosted by the Vineyard Theater. I am Brandon Durden. And I'm Crystal Dickinson. And, and we're married. Yeah, so listen, we aren't breaking any uh, COVID rules. Nope. We have, we've been married for, uh, what is it, 14, 14 years? Yes. yes. Got it right. Yes. Um, but we have a packed show for you today. Oh, absolutely wonderful show with some of the greatest minds and actors and art in act actors and activists subject matter of the show tonight and um, time. and if, uh, i would also like to say about this particular event right it's called the vineyard live community conversation this is um part of uh three different uh ways to participate in the commissaries um uh what is that word that you would say, like union? <laughs> Sounds so with with um, with the Vineyard Theater. Um, we're in residence here with the Vineyard Theater, and this is uh, another part of what we do here. So there is um a, this is the live event, which is free and will continue to be free in perpetuity, on um, the Vineyard's uh, Facebook page and, and YouTube. And YouTube. So um, if you if you have a friend, if you listen today and you love it and a friend misses it, you can say- Share the links. Yes, please yeah. share it. Please share it with everyone you know. Um, so let's, yes, yeah, so yeah. now let's get right to it for real because we have so much we're, to do. Yeah. We're so excited um, because there's just so much good stuff. So yeah. let's get to it. So at the top of the conversation, uh, to kick us off, we're gonna have Nana who is a wonderful company member of the commissary and she's gonna do an uh, example of the in-ear work that we do. And this is gonna be a piece from Kathleen Cleaver. Uh, and we're gonna hide and watch while we do Nana. And what this in-ear work is, if you're new to us, is she's listening to a recording of Kathleen Cleaver and she is going to actually be speaking the words of Kathleen Cleaver. So uh, it's, it's really cool. It doesn't need any more explanation from me. We're just gonna go hide and watch. Nana, if you can grace us, please. Take it away. Whether you call them beasts now or you wait 20 years later and say, oh, children, they, they're some real beasts. I'm sorry I didn't deal with it then. You know, I mean, ain't nobody waiting on you. I'm just telling you, you see, that there is a very crucial time right now where a lot of realignments and reshiftings are being made and people that are concerned about the revolutionary struggle in this country recognize that and are moving to do what they can to strengthen the shit because we see as a result of all the activity of the past 10 years, the riots and rebellions and acts of people's warfare throughout the past 10 years. And our base is very strong. There is no need for this intimidation, this paradoia. Do you know why they run all this Pan-African madness through these campuses? So you sit up and trip on Pan-Africanism and don't think about what's going on in Cairoy, Illinois. And do you know what's going on in Cairo, Illinois? What? For two years, the people in that community have been engaged in armed confrontation every night with the racist forces of the police, the Ku Klux Klan, the American Nazi party, the state troopers fighting with tanks and machine guns directed towards the black community. Do you have a division there? 3,000 black people against 3,000 white people and they are fighting and they have been fighting for two years. <laughs> Ain't nobody giving up no details on how many did or wounded on either side, but it's not very many. And you have to recognize the situation in Wilmington, North Carolina, where the fascists have just said, well, we ready for the civil war. We, we accept your challenge, you know, let's deal with it. Let's get it on. And you have to realize that the fascists are preparing this type of thing under your nose. They don't give you any information of what you do when you turn up one morning and look around and say, oh, you think you're going to the elections. You might be going off to a concentration camp. These communities inside the United States, they represent the model of the future. And we have to recognize in our cities, in our ghettos, in our things that we will, we will be encircled. We are being surrounded. We have to build tactics and practices that will enable us to survive this stage of the warfare. We have to be in a position to prepare ourselves now to endure the conditions of war that will be visited upon us. 
the reason I keep bringing up to you the conditions of the LA 13 and, and Brother Geronimo is because of the way it reveals the profound conspiracy over months and months and months hatched by the all the agencies of the Los Angeles Police Department, the FBI coordination with the headquarters in Washington and the Pentagon and sort of, sort of to destroy a handful of black Afro-American revolutionaries or fighters or lumpen proletariats beginning to develop an ideology in the heart of Los Angeles. They went through all three of these changes to do that. You have to recognize what kind of power that represents and why they have to deal with all these changes just to deal with this small group and what it is that threatens them and how do they work and how do they operate and investigate that, you see? and get those details and bring them out and go take them to the black community where people care about this stuff. You understand me? Or do you care? Because the efforts on the part of these police with those who destroy the burgeoning leadership, the burgeoning direction, the burgeoning cadre of the liberation forces, these people have destroyed liberation forces. They have destroyed struggles. They have destroyed undergrounds, parties, revolutions around the world over the past 25 years. You take Indonesia, you take Turkey, you take anywhere and see the struggles that they have destroyed. And when you talk about Vietnam and Korea, these places, you talk about the struggles that have transcended all of their efforts to destroy them. So you can't believe that just because a revolution is on the ground is automatically going to be successful. That is not the case. And you are dealing with the masters of destruction. You have to face up to the fact that there is an inevitable culmination of all the attacks and repressions and the aggressive acts being perpetrated in the black community by the organized armed forces of repression. The police, the courts, whatever, have one culmination. That culmination is war. And that is what we are confronting. In terms of the confrontation represented by these brothers that are in the old county jail presently and receiving no support, no money, court appointed attorneys, the whole thing is very lackadaisical and the pigs think they got it all sewed up. I have to realize that this is a, a position, a matter of principle, it's a reality, it's a situation in which those people who stood up for the validity of the principle of not only the right of Afro-American people, black people, oppressed people to wage armed struggle and self-defense, but who actually engage in this, on this defense of this Gestapo raid in the black community on the Central Avenue headquarters of the Black Panther Party. They expose a very basic contradiction that is apparent not only in the operation called the Black Panther Party, but throughout the so-called movement, the so throughout this country, in principle, whether armed struggle is or is not possible, valid, and whatever. And there are a lot of people that go around talking this talk. But when it comes down to it, they turn around and let you deal with it. Nine of you go to deal with it, and one of you end up with all the pigs, you see? And that's the situation that's been our fate for so long that we got to recognize that and stop repeating ourselves and raise things to a higher level because that's where they're going around the country and around the world the opposition the enemy the power structure is raising theirs to a higher level to be better prepared to deal with what they have foreseen in the period of the 60s and early 70s I would ask you, and I know there may be a one or two, so I'm not, I'm just asking you, if you will, if you are concerned students, especially black students, to take it upon yourselves to go down to the old county courthouse, old county jail, and investigate that. Take it upon yourselves to listen to what's being said about the LAPD and investigate that. And take it upon yourselves to relate to the needs and the practical 
present, um, uh, how would you say, uh, program that we can apply to forward the Afro-American liberation struggle. The one thing that we are interested in, in carrying out at this present time is development of what we call the Revolutionary People's Communication Network, which is an um, apparatus which would link up the information facilities that are available to us so that information such as this, so that the case of uh, LA-13 does not go down the drain for lack of information, so that the situation of the contradictions within the parties, with, with the split within the League of Black Workers and the International, I'm sorry, the League of Black Workers and the International Black Workers Congress does not go ignored. So the situation within the Republic of New Africa and their split does not go ignored because the split is just a process of transformation and growth within a political apparatus Apparatus. And the whole thing of 20 years later will culminate in some apparatus that all of this is the groundwork for. You have to recognize that struggle, struggles develop in phases, on levels, and that you people here who are capable of doing certain things, you shouldn't be so slack. You see what I'm saying? That there is a lot that can be done that does not call that much from you. It's nothing more than passing out a leaflet or helping put out a newspaper or getting on the radio or going down to a courtroom. But if you show some concern, you see, because what we're talking about and what we've always talked about is the power of the people. You see, the people have this power to defeat this. It has been demonstrated in Cairo, the power of the people united around their own desire to survive and defeat this uh, attack that they can survive. It has been demonstrated over 25 years in Vietnam the tremendous irresistible power of the people once properly organized, properly directed, educated, and continually elevated to a higher and higher level of struggle. And we have to recognize these dialectics and recognize these phases and identify these things and find out how we ourselves can apply these principles to the situation of Afro-American people. And this is what uh, the contradictions of the Black Panther Party came out in the first place, because how we apply the principles Principles, the principle of armed struggle, the principle of educating the masses, the principle of organizing the people, the principle of many other things. If you really want to know, you can check out the Red Book. They all, they all outline there. And just because Nixon's going over there doesn't change it. It's still valid. You see what I'm saying? So basically, we're coming from the same point that all the members of the LA 13, the victims of this police conspiracy on a city, state, and national and international level, right here in your backyard, downtown LA, are victims of. And we're coming from the same principle that they came from that has proven to be successful. And that is, they dare to struggle, dare to win. All power to the people, brothers and sisters. Hmm. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. All right. All right. To deal with these things, whether you want to deal with them, we have to deal with them. And we relate to some financial support to deal with these cases and to deal with these issues and to mobilize things and to pay for gas, etc. And we asking you to make a small contribution out of your pocket to us whose pockets are empty. And there'll be some sisters passing out some buckets around here. <laughs> nah, nah, the homie. <laughs> the buckets is my favorite part. The buckets. You need the buckets. You need the buckets. The revolution won't be televised. The revolution also costs money. Come on now. Come on now. How you gonna get there? You need some exactly. gas. You need some gas. That's right. That's right. So drop some in that venue bucket while y'all at it. There you go. There you go. Go ahead because this is the revolution. That's this right. is what we're doing. This is what we're talking about. This thing got levels to it. That's I mean, right. she says it. Kathleen Cleaver, 1971, addressing the audience in Los Angeles, California, y'all. It's got levels. levels to it. Levels. Thank levels. you. We know you in London. You're uh, you ahead of us in more ways than one. 
but particularly uh, time-wise, we time. just appreciate you so much. We wanted to make sure that uh, we got you in and, and got blessed from you real fast. And uh, yeah. don't stick yeah. with us. And we so appreciate you, your time and your talent. Yes. I'll see you it's guys soon. Here to win. I love that. All power to the people. All, All power right. to the people. Love you. Keep love rocking. Bye, soon. guys. Love you. Love Mm. All right now. So All right. Okay. We are in. We are in. Again, if you just join us, I'm Brandon Durden. And I'm Crystal Dickinson. And we are your moderators for an extraordinary conversation that we're going to have in our Sunday conversations with the commissary and the Vineyard Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, so without further ado, and we'll talk about what we just saw too. Uh, without further ado, I want to bring on our celebrated uh, panelists. Yeah. First, we got Mr. Cody Renard Richard. Uh, a little background on Cody. Cody is an advocate, educator, and professional stage manager with a career that spans many genres, including Broadway, off-Broadway, television, and opera. He's worked on the Broadway productions of Freestyle Love Supreme, Hamilton, and Kinky Boots, and on live televised musicals for NBC, including Jesus Christ Superstar Live, Hairspray Live, The Wiz Live. He teaches at NYU and Columbia. He has worked actively with numerous organizations, including Broadway Advocacy Coalition, where he founded the Cody Renard Richard Scholarship Program for aspiring BIPOC theater makers. Please welcome Cody Renard Richard. Come on in, Cody. Hello, hello. Hey. hey. Welcome, my brother. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank oh, you for being you. here. We're going to bring in a, another, a few other celebrated panelists. Yes. And so, um, you know, um, Nana's. Uh, Kathleen Cleaver uh, was about activism, right? And that these fantastic people that we have talking to us today are talking about just that, how activism, how they use their art um, as a form of activism. And Cody, I'm so interested to hear about your, um, your, um, uh, your scholarship program in that way. I mean, that sounds like activism to me, right? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, I should say pass the buckets. Uh, yes, pass. Put something in the buckets. <laughs> um, Cody got buckets. <laughs> All right. I have the great privilege of um, introducing y'all to. Okay, she is my one of my heroes, one of my heroes. Um, uh, Pearl Clegg. Pearl Clegg's work spans many uh, genres. She's a playwright, an essayist, a novelist, a poet, and a political activist. Her play Flying West was most produced was the most produced play in the country in 1994. And her first novel, What Looks Like Crazy on an Ordinary Day, was an Oprah Book Club pick. And she spent nine weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Her subsequent novels have been consistent bestsellers and critically acclaimed. She is currently a playwright in residence at the Alliance Theater in Atlanta and is a longtime political activist. And this description does this woman no justice because when the times get really, really hard and I don't know what else to do, I call on the phenomenal Pearl Clegg. Welcome. Uh, thank you all so much for having me. Oh, that was so that. that was so wonderful. That was like time travel for me because I grew up with that voice and that kind of, <laughs> of that kind of meeting and that kind of past the buckets at the end. That was like I am a '60s child, and that was amazing. So oh, we, 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 yeah, we were absolutely. <laughs> we're gonna let you travel further, further, further <laughs> time, Pearl, and we're gonna hear from you in just a second. We're gonna bring on a third panelist. And we're gonna just get started with it. Uh, we have the distinct honor of bringing Andy Jean in, and she is a costume designer for the stage and screen. So we got a great cross section of artists here. Uh, some of her acclaimed work includes Alicia Harris's "What to Stand Up When It Goes Down," James Baldwin's "A Man Corner," Alexis Shears' "Our Dear Dead Drug Lord," and the Vineyards, our host company now, the Vineyard Theater's production of Ngozi's Anyanwu's "Good Grief." Uh, she has spent this pandemic time organizing for change and fighting for equal rights for Black trans lives and for all of us. Please welcome Andy Jean. Queen Jean. Hi, what's going on? Yes. Hey. <laughs> Hi, y'all. What's hey, going hey. on? Don't mind me. I'm just having a little Capri Sun. I mean, <laughs> you know. Stay hydrated. Hi, yes. Hi, everyone. This is such an honor. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good evening. I know. Hi. So, you know what? I had a question, but Pearl, we—I uh, just want to start. You—you you are our resident 
historian in this respect. So you were just saying you were so excited because it took you back to to this time. So can you will you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, on the west side of Detroit, and my family, um, they were not just activists. My father was very, very active. We were a black nationalist separatist family so that my family, you know, my dad founded a political party, the Freedom Now Party. He was always running for office. He was a minister and our church was always very involved in everything so that whenever any radical people came through town, they always came by and spoke at my father's church to talk to my dad. So. I've known Kathleen Cleaver for so long. She now lives around the corner from me in Atlanta, which is a small world kind of moment. But the way she was talking, the directness, the truth of what she was saying and her absolute fearlessness was just, it took me back because that's what I miss. People who are prepared to step forward and say, this is my analysis. This is what I think. And if you don't agree, argue it with me. Let's talk about it. But put forward a program. You know, this is what I'm trying to do. And when she got to the end and said, wait, wait, this stuff costs money, put some money in the bucket. It was like, how many times at my dad's church did I have to carry that bucket around and get the people <laughs> to give their money and all that because everything costs money. You know, you can't make flyers with no money. You can't have sandwiches to take to people who are gonna be in a demonstration if you don't have money. So that the idea of channeling that kind of voice um, from the sixties is just so magical to me what you're doing that it 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 actually is like time travel because i'm i'm sitting in my my little cluttered office at home thinking oh my god this is like the 60s this is what the soundtrack of my life was like going to meetings every day going to demonstrations every day and it's lovely that you're bringing the work forward at a moment when we couldn't possibly need it more yeah. you know it's like this is that moment when all of those ideas have to be brought forward and unpacked again and looked at how we can translate them into what works now. But it it made me feel really hopeful and energized and like, okay, let's go, let's go march on something, you know, <laughs> let's go do it. Let's do it. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. You know, we are, and, and I was sharing with, with Pearl and, and Cody and, and our queen that you joined us. And if you aren't familiar with the work that the commissary does, and I know we kind of launched right into the work, but what uh, what you just witnessed Nana doing is that we she's listening to a recorded uh, interview or speech uh, from Kathleen Cleaver, and we and as part of our work we've stumbled on uh, is is visiting or revisiting powerful thinkers like Kathleen Cleaver and James Baldwin, Nikki Giovanni, Maya uh, Angelou, Angelou, the list goes on, Ozzy and Ruby, De, uh, you know Ozzy D, uh, Ozzy Davis, Ruby D. Uh, and so we're, 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 in a sense, parroting what we hear, but, it, but more than that, we're allowing those words to penetrate through us and come through us. And it's not like we're trying to necessarily imitate them, but we are trying to get inside of the message. And just to speak what you was, uh, to talk to what you were uh, offering, Pearl, is that there is a, a directness to, to the language and to the, and to the naming of, of, of the times and, and, and the problems. So, so in that spirit, I want to pose the question to each of you in terms of your own activism through your art. Is there, a, can you, is there a naming of source that, that brought you to, to the type of work that you do specifically in, in, in your respective fields? Uh, can, you, can you name a deficiency or a problem or something you're trying to address through your art and, and the specific path that, that you see yourself taking to address those issues? And this is just an open, anybody can res respond to it, yeah. Um, I, hey everybody, um, I guess for me, um, I guess to name, uh, to name it is, is, uh, is probably the lack of reflection of, of myself in the field. Um, um, growing up, uh, aspiring to be a stage manager, aspiring to be a leader in the theater, specifically speaking of the theater, I rarely saw anyone doing what I wanted to do who looks like me. And that's that stage managing, directing, producing. And and I've been, you know, I've been working on Broadway for the last 10 years and I've worked with maybe two or three other black stage managers um, directly. So that was that's been a driving point for me being visible and me um, trying to urge other people um, 
to 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 welcome in a new generation and a new voice and more people. So that's kind of I guess I guess the naming point for me of what like activated me to like okay we got someone has to do something someone has to like forge a path for someone else and not to say that like you know i'm opening up all these doors hopefully one day i am but i think that that you know every little bit moves forward and that's kind of i guess what initially probably activated me to 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 do the type of work that i'm doing mm -hmm. um, i think um something um that's that pearl tapped on is that you know it, it that these people, they're ordinary, and something that we in the commissary notice time after time when we are we are channeling these people's words. They were ordinary people. They were ordinary people going about their lives, doing what they do, doing what they love to do, and then and then saying, How can I use my ordinary life? Or how can I use what I know to be to to speak to help to help others, right? And I think that maybe Pearl, that's what you refer to of like this forwardness about it, right? And I think it, it it demands that kind of forwardness because it's like, oh, it's something I, I this is I met with it. I'm just I met with this thing in front of me, and I can either walk away or act like I don't see it, or just you know, just just stay in my lane, make my money, do my thing, and be and that's it. But these people, then I, I guess. The extraordinariness is that they said yes, is that they took on the task, like the three of you, that you take on the task to say there's a deficiency and I want to fill it. But but the, the brilliance and the beauty is that you're just human human people. You're not you're not, you know, you're superhero heroes in my mind, but you're just you're just everyday people just trying to do the right thing. And that's the same thing Kathleen Cleaver was trying to do, you know. Mm -hmm. What about you? Paul? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, I was about to say, um, first, I just wanted to acknowledge Pearl. I think that is so, um, I, growing up in the church as well in Huntsville, Alabama, you know, whenever the love offering came, you know, it probably came right after the sermon, uh, after the powerful sermon, right, that we need to uh, invoke um, this offering so that well, we can continue doing the work, right? If we need this fuel, if we need this rejuvenation, it can only come if we are supported. So I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that and, um, you know, in that testament to it. Um, I think for me personally, Queen, I will say um, I realize that um, we can no longer really depend on the people in power. Uh, I'm so glad to see that um, little uh, poster back there, Pearl, because I think we have mm -hmm. to become the people in power. Uh, I think as a society, as a group, um, we've been waiting, waiting for people to acknowledge us, waiting for people to honor us, waiting for these institutions to actually wake up and say, how can we be of service? Mm -hmm. um, those questions have not been asked really un uh, until the death of George Floyd in the aftermath. So I think for me as a artist, as a speaker, as an activist, that is my role. We have to speak up. We cannot wait for other people to uh, guide us. There is no rule book. There's no, uh, we only have the teachings of our, of our leaders, of our ancestors, our matriarchs, James Baldwin, Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, Pearl, right? We have these writers and thinkers and creators who are actually giving us tools that we can use tools that will stimulate, tools that will empower and educate a community, because that's how we're really gonna get the change. It's not just waiting for someone to be elected or someone to say, oh, we're not gonna make things right. It has to be a communal effort. And so I think for me, um, being able to help galvanize a community just feels right. It feels that it's our sovereign right. Yeah. It is our reigning season. So I definitely feel like it is now time for us to show up. And we can show up for each other. Mm. And that definitely includes Black trans people. That's so, right. Yeah. Um, Pearl, you already kind of talked about you, like, I think since uh, <laughs> carrying the basket in the church, you've been, <laughs> you've been in it. You've been in the game for, uh, you know, for a long time. So I wonder if, as us, you know, younger activists and people who, what have you learned? What's a, what's a, What's a thing you've learned that you want to that you could share with us about? This sounds corny, but about being a successful activist, like help you know, the like longevity do, of the, it. Yeah, the how do we how do we do it well? How do we? Where did you have pitfalls, or where can we 
we, how can we strengthen ourselves? Or what's important? What do you think is important for us to know? I think one of the things that that I feel protective about younger um, artists sometimes is because for me, I grew up in an all black environment. I was in an all black neighborhood. All the institutions that served my life were black. All the schools I went to were black. My neighbors were all black so that I never had that feeling that I had to please white people. I didn't see any white people. You know, I mean, it wasn't that wasn't the idea so that growing up in a place where the cultural institutions brought me to a black audience meant that when I started writing plays, I wasn't worrying about pleasing people on Broadway. Mm-hmm. I wasn't worrying about pleasing white audiences. I was worried about pleasing them Negroes on the west side of Detroit okay. because they would tell you if it wasn't good. So that the whole thing that that I was able to, to do, which people are not so able to do now just because our institutions have have not survived, was that I was working in the professional theater for 20 years without ever walking into what people would call a white American theater. I didn't have to. There was a living, breathing network of black theaters. And I was working there. I was working for Woody King. I was working for, you know, um, David Rambo in Detroit. I was working for Robert Hooks. So that the idea of having to come up in a space where you're always dealing with what do white people want to see? What do white people want to hear? It saps your energy. It saps your ability to say, this is what I honestly think and feel. Um, and I feel very protective um, of many of the black artists that I meet who are younger because they've never been in an environment where that white gaze was not the determining factor. You know, they'll go to a school like Yale and then they come out and they're working in New York. And the I, the, the press of having to please white people is so intense that you never have that chance to say, let me just see what I think and what my community thinks about it. And then we will together talk to other communities. But it's it's very debilitating, I think, to be an artist and not be able to work in front of people who talk like you, mm-hmm. look like you, know the jokes, you know, so you don't have to explain. When we say kitchen, we mean the back of your hair. We don't mean the place where you cook food. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff, which is so real, you know, but it, it dilutes the work and it's exhausting to have to explain yourself to white people all the time. And I think just listening to Kathleen Cleaver, I think the, the big thing that we used to really feel was don't apologize for how we think and feel. Don't apologize for the reality we know. When people try to argue with you, well, that's not, I don't feel that way like that's not your life that's my life that's our life as a community and we get to to assert it we get to live it we get to talk about it honor it critique it all those things but we have to find a way to do that in a circle of each other that says yes say your truth say what you know be yourself be yourself and whatever it is i'm gonna love it as long as it's true and it's you i'm gonna love it amen yeah and 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 cody and queen and you know, in, in your walk as, as activists, have, what have you learned in terms of in, to, in adding to this conversation, these, these pearls that Pearl has so beautifully dropped on us? What, what has surprised you in your walk? Uh, what, what are some of the takeaways that you learned? What are some of the, or maybe some of the pivots you've had to make in your walk? And it's particularly both of you working in predominantly um, white institutions. Uh, I just have to say, first of all, Pearl, I'm so honored to be listening to you today. It's, it's a, it's, this is amazing. Um, <laughs> um, but I guess like some surprises and takeaways, like what Crystal mentioned earlier, um, being yourself takes you a lot mm. further than trying to answer to someone's expectations of you. And when I think of like advocating for other people and when I think of um, becoming activated to to affect change, I have to remember that I have to speak from my experience and my voice and and just offering an extension of myself. And that's how I'm able to empower and lead people. And that was something that I I guess I knew, but I didn't really accept. And that that was kind of surprising. Um, so that's one of the, the lessons that I've learned and try, I've tried to lean into that some more. Um, oh, go ahead, please. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say that last, our last, um, it was a live, um, or the first live that we did, Brandon and I did the, an in ear t- as an example, and I, we have this forum, community forum, but then we also have a live night where we 
as commissary artists, we're all together and you just see what our process is like because we're all together. It's an group. open rehearsal. An so. Open rehearsal. And in that open rehearsal, Brandon and I had the privilege of um, doing um, an interview with Ozzy and Ruby. And that was something that they spoke about. I just wanted to, re you know, like to forward that, that narrative because something that Ozzy said, he said, our community has supported us. Um, and that's what carried them all the time. They, they showed up for their community. That, that was, that's what I got from yeah. that interview between the two of them. They were, and he said, we doing what we love to do, service our community, you know? And um, it's been a wonderful experience for us because that, that has seeped into our pores now. Us saying those words from them has seeped into our pores. And, then, and what you're saying 100% resonates with me, Cody, for that very reason. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, I, on the flip side of, of Pearl's experience, I didn't, I wasn't brought up into the theater or in, in the in the theater where I didn't have to work in white institutions or appease um, white uh, power, for lack of a better term. Um, so navigating that and trying to, to name it was something that I didn't do until much later in my career. And then when I finally realized what that meant and kind of what I've been subscribing to, I was able to be clear on how to kind of maneuver the way I work and the maneuver the conversations that I have and, and how to talk to people, you know? And I, and I find that very interesting because I, I, you know, we're not that in college, we're not taught to be or taught to work a system to get ahead. You know, um, so that's another thing that I've really learned mm. on my. Mm -hmm. mm. And Queen, did you want to add anything to it? Oh, sorry, I'm trying to get to this unmute. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's I will definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I agree. I um, I think for me personally, in terms of having to pivot, I kind of had to unlearn a lot of things that I was feeling um, and that our success has to be adjacent to whiteness, that the that the barometer of success that we are trying to achieve is in likeness to whiteness, right? That we all must have an understanding of Shakespeare. We all have to have an understanding of iambic pentameter. We all have to know the a period of, of, of whiteness but that there is actual magic in who we are as people. Um, even from our ancestral journey, even in this country, we have always been natural storytellers. We've always been gifted, naturally born, naturally beautiful. So I had to learn that our rich, that our experiences are the richness that money cannot buy. Right? That I don't need for, uh, we don't have to think that, oh, if it isn't a particular type of black tragedy, that it won't be given that it won't have that producing power if it isn't a particular narrative of blackness. So I think for me, I was like, as soon as I was like, okay, look, boop, boop we can do it because we are, we are divine. Yes. We have that ancestral right. Yes. So for me, I lead with that now, uh, you know, not, not really uh, obsessing over white fragility, not really obsessing over white acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. The acknowledgement is from Right, that what I'm putting out into the world, uh, the things that I'm being able to create, that they will sustain 50, 60 years from now. Right, that people will talk about the work that they came to see, impression that it left on them. Yeah. Not about necessarily, oh, well, we got awarded for this thing. Yeah. And you know what I'm thinking too, what it did, y'all just made me think about is that in doing that, in doing just doing the work, I think part of the activism is also um, helping people to realize that it doesn't have to be an either or. It doesn't have to be either or. These things can exist. This is America. Like I don't know when people are gonna wake up to that. Like these, all these things can exist and be great. They don't. It doesn't have to be this. This is the top thing, and this is the other thing that does. You know that like just the black people care about. I, we are we are ingrained in in one another's history, and like the sooner we are, able to um accept that love that even though it hurts it's gonna be phenomenal we already i mean look every time you go i'm my my son is watching bts he loves bts bts is just doing what, what new edition did 
Mm-hmm. You know, and that and that just goes to show the reach, the reach of our joy, the, like you saying, Queen, the reach of what we can do, the possibilities of what we can offer, not just to America, but to the world. Yeah. And those things can happen. They can happen just like this. They can go forward or, or go, they can go like this, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm supposed to be moderating this chat to see if we got any questions. Yeah. We are a live program. So if you are watching, uh, we got room for you. So uh, uh, type in your questions, yeah, comments, concerns, happen. and I'll try to be uh, diligent in, in looking at that <laughs> and, and, and getting your voice in here and having our can I Can I say something about, about being an activist? Yes. I think that I think that sometimes when people talk about being an activist, they act like it's so, like a terrible weight on you. You know, oh my God, you've been working for your people your whole life. You know, how can you? You know, how did you manage to stay sane? How did you manage to? And it's a great life because you're deeply grounded in the people that produced you in this world. So that you know, when people try to say to me, you know, God, isn't it hard? And isn't it? It's like I always say, think about what wonderful energy that is to be grounded like that and moved like that in your personal life throughout. So it's political, it's personal, it's your work life, it's everything you do. And there are no love affairs better than the love affairs that take place in a movement Mm. because you're trying to change the world. You know, you're trying to march over and knock down city hall and then you all go out together and drink wine and talk (laughs) about what you did and what you're going to do next time. Because Kathleen Cleaver was talking to the the meeting so she was being so serious but you know she went out with her friends afterward and they talked about what happened and they laughed about what happened and they saw each other because that's part of what being an activist does it keeps you from being so isolated Mm. you know that's the that's the thing sometimes you all are so isolated you know in these big institutions that are not black institutions that it feels like oh my god i'm out here all by myself i'm out here all by myself and i sometimes when i'm at the alliance theater which still has overwhelmingly white audience white staff and we're working on it but it's like that moment where you say okay this is a small part of the world this is a small part of the cultural life of america and i i agree with you crystal this is america it's much richer than we know it to be. And my mother used to always say the purpose of demonstrations is twofold. One is to let the people in power see how many thousands of us there are. And the other one is to let us see how many thousands of us there are. So when we go out in the street, we feel like, okay, we're telling them, we're showing them. And then we look next to us and there's a hundred thousand people. And we look to the other side and there's a hundred thousand people. And we all sing loud and off key and march where we're going because that that's a kind of energy that doesn't depend on awards. It doesn't depend on New York Times bestseller list. It doesn't depend on any of that stuff. It depends on being able to tell the truth and feel the truth. And if in our work, we can do that, whatever that work is, if we can get to the real truth and tell it, people will find us. They always do because people are looking for the truth. And if anyone is not looking for the truth, they're immediately identifiable. Because then you can say, oh, that's Donald Trump. He's not looking for the truth. Oh, that's Mitch McConnell. He's not looking for the truth. And write them off and go to the people who are looking for the truth Amen. at a small level, your neighbors, your friends, and at that big level who you're going to vote for on election day. But it, it really is the, it's not sacrificial energy and it's not how terrible. It's like, you know, you all are married doing some of the best work of your lives and you got a kid, you're raising a kid, you're being movement activist people, artist activist people, all of you. And it's like, don't you feel good when you get to do it and be around other people who are saying, oh, I feel that way too. Mm-hmm. I've had that same experience. I need that from you. And that's the thing. I don't care anything about people giving me awards. I want people to come up and hug me after the play. Hey, and say, that was just like my mama. That sure did sound like my boyfriend. I am so glad you punished that one because she was a lying weasel. She wasn't any good. I want that. And all that other stuff is just gravy. I want to be able to draw people together and show them the truth. And then they will support the work that we do forever and ever. Amen. They will. Because we all want that from culture. Show me me. What do I look like? You know, when I'm in love, when I'm bad, when I'm good. Yeah. Show me myself. And as long as we can do that, the the people that Kathleen was talking about in such rapturous terms, the people will find us. You know, because the people are us. We are. We yeah. are the people. See, I told you my dad's a minister. So when oh. I get around beautiful people and they're talking about changing the world, 
I don't mean to preach, but it's Sunday too, oh, so it's Christmas <laughs> fault for asking me. <laughs> what else did we ask? <laughs> That's what we asked you for. Wow. That's it. That's why Queen might get activated. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to exalt and say yes, all those affirmations. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think for honestly, the uh, I know for myself personally, we've been uh, in the streets since June 1st. And, you know, it, it definitely feels like there uh, was a phase, right? After, the, you know, the 4th of July, everyone kind of went back, you know, to entanglements, went back to Tiger King, whatever they were getting into. <laughs> But the reality is we are still out here fighting for black liberation, black trans liberation. We are fighting to not just be seen, but to be embraced, to have real power, permanent power, right? They're out here giving all types of awards and acknowledgements, but what does that really mean for the young person coming up after us, mm -hmm. right? Is there gonna actually be a seat? Is there gonna be a path for them to follow, right? Are we going to leave um, nutrients so that they can be nourished? later down the road. So I think for me that is just so, so, so important. Um, and I'll be honest, like, um, you're right. I mean, I definitely find that you have become familiar with the people that you're around, um, not only because it's, there's a mutual understanding, but we're, we're working towards the same thing. We are both excited, we are all excited by the same thing, right, to actually be fully liberated what does that look like? What does a world look like where you can go see a show tonight and there's eight different plays written by black and brown beautiful people? What does that look like, right? That 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 we don't have to wait on a slot. We don't have to wait on a slot this season, Come on. right? That there's eight different shows on Broadway mm -hmm. where there's all access to you know to our stories. Yes. That people will travel from all over the world, not just for the one acclaimed show, but for all the shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Cody, you, um, I mean, talk, I mean, Queen was just talking about leaving something behind, and your scholarship fund, it seems to be doing just that. Could you talk a little bit about how you came at it, or? Um... Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, yes, leaving something behind. I think the beauty of of, of being an activist and activism is is yes for our community and for us but it's also for the next generation you know what i mean like everything that we do should be setting up the next generation for a better chance at whatever it is and this scholarship is 1000 percent a reflection of that um it's, it's it's providing money for uh young black and brown individuals it's also providing mentorship and resources people that they don't that they wouldn't have access to you know i think one of the biggest things that we're talking about the theater black and brown people don't necessarily get in as easy as some of our other counterparts because they don't have the mm. connections unless they go to school in new york they don't have the access they don't have the connections to to reach out to these people so i'm hoping to be able to provide that for them and like sort of be you know a gateway path for them to graduate and have people that they know and just reflections of themselves in this business. So that's kind of um, what sparked this scholarship. Um, it's, it's, it's for um, BIPOC individuals who are studying non-performance related degrees. Mm. Uh, I think it's important that, that I say that because we talk about diversity and inclusion almost every year. And most of the time we focus on what's on the stage. And up until this year, it's been the first year that people have been talking about that in leadership positions and in you know backstage mm -hmm. about it more widely i guess um so this scholarship is is for that it's for is to make sure that we can usher in you know bipoc leaders designers creators stage managers you know um all of those fields that we don't see ourselves um reflected in a lot um so that's that's the hope um uh so we'll see you know but that's that's kind of what what it's about Man, yeah, yeah. I'm so happy you, you mentioned that, Cody. I mean, just as a, as a performer myself and, and someone who undeservedly gets a lot of the praise that should go rightly to you and the people that you don't see, you know, I cannot tell, I cannot help people understand what a difference it makes to have someone who knows me, who loves me, who sees me advocating for me and be a go-between, you know, like the stage managers have to do. It is. It makes the difference between the success of, of the entire production when you have those people who are, who are, who are out there eight times a week. You, you know that that the people see have them rightfully and fully supported. 
and, and Quinn as a costume designer, right? But before we even get to where the audience is, is coming in, right? To know that we have a structure in place that, that is holistic, that, that, that can speak to every piece of our existence. And that we're understood mm -hmm. and that we're under, like just understood, like where we're coming from as artists and what we want to create, that there's not, there's a shorthand that you don't have to yeah. leap over, mm -hmm. even if it's just talking about my hair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm it's, so so happy we, we pulled that in. You know, the conversation, man. You you've already answered 17 of the questions that I had written down, just even in the in the, in the outpouring of, of the love that you're, you're showing. Um, but I I, I do want to uh, talk a little bit about this idea. Sometimes as an activist, I can feel like I'm in an echo chamber where I'm just preaching to the choir, and and in those moments. Right, as 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 rejuvenating as it can be, sometimes I do have those moments like, is this where is this is this reaching beyond our inner circle? So I mean, I'm wondering, do you ever have those thoughts? Does it ever bring doubt in terms of the the the, the impact that you're having outside of our echo chambers, and and what keeps you going if you have had those those feelings come up? Yes, Queen. Okay, look, I thought the spirit of Teddy Riley was about to set in. Hold on. Okay. okay, I think the connection is good. Sorry, I had <laughs> the oh, LeBron's yeah. were going we were beautiful. The LeBron's were going down. Um, <laughs> um, I agree. I think um, I think for me, to be honest, I, uh, I have never felt um, more deeply seated in my purpose. So I think for me, when I, uh, when we speak or when we're advocating, um, to me, I just feel like that is the one I feel the most grounded. Um, I'm not uh, fearing anything. God does not give us the spirit of fear. So where does it come from? I think fear comes from folks trying to make excuses, mm -hmm. trying to stop embracing, trying to make uh, more opposition. That is just for me a tool of white supremacy. I feel that if we are actually really trying to navigate change, trying to navigate what our future will look like, we just have to leap into it fully. We cannot have any reservations. Mm. We cannot be questioning or equivocating when it comes to what our future can look like. So when I speak, I just speak from, from that, from, from that core and from an understanding that I know that we will win. It is our wow. destiny to win. Yes. It's our reigning season. So I think for me, I, I, that is something that I, uh, I keep in mind and I express it fully. Um, but it, it, it does feel sometimes that... Um, it, you know, if folks aren't as receptive, but I think part of that is saying, well, well how can we say it another way, mm -hmm. right? Um, it doesn't always have to come from one person even, right? Someone else may share a testimony or an experience that might actually enlighten what you're going through, that might speak to the very thing that you are trying to suppress, mm -hmm. that you have not acknowledged. And the reality is we are all carrying trauma, fear, burden, pain pain. And so to say, I'm going to actually take pain away. I'm not going to actually feel it. I'm not going to feed it anymore. I'm going to actually embrace this idea of liberation. I'm going to really embrace the idea of what I can do for myself, how we can all actually help each other. I think that's part of the big problem is that we've all been in our own little silos, right? Trying to reach the thing instead of talking, instead of saying, actually, how can we all get here? And when we all get to that mountaintop, when we all roll that boulder up the mountain like Sisyphus, right? How about we say, we're not going to allow it to roll back down. We're not going to allow it to take us back. Mm -hmm. It's not about regression or suppression. This is about real liberation, how we can hold space and we do not have to wait for someone to give it to us. We can create it. We don't need a seat at their table. What if it looks like if we build our own house? Our own house and we can have multiple tables. We can have a breakfast nook. We can have a dining table. We can put so many table leaves in that table that it will stretch and it will grow and it will grow. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. Thank you. Because we built the tables in the first place. Message. <laughs> Was that, I'm sorry, Pearl, I see your mic on. Did you want to add something to that? Well, I just, I think I agree. I have, amen, a thousand percent. I agree with what you said. And I think that that's the challenge is to, is to really 
take seriously that old civil rights movement thing about freedom is a constant struggle. It's not like, okay, we're done now. You know, we won, we're good. It's like, it's a constant struggle because what we're trying to do is to move the country into being the place we know that it should be yes. and move ourselves into being um, the kind of humans that we know that we have to be. And that's not something that will end in our lifetime um, or even in our children's lifetime. So that the idea that all you have to do is take your step forward. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to be worrying about, did I win the movement for everybody? Just you take your step. You know, you don't have to get 20 people to vote. That would be great. But just you make sure you cast a ballot so that it's it's less a question, I think, of not having bad days. Because I think we all have those days when we just say, what the hell am I doing? You know, I'm writing plays. I should be out doing whatever. And then I say, first of all, I don't know how to do anything else. It's too late <laughs> to get a straight job. I don't know anything about that world at all. So it's like I have to figure out how to make writing plays be a part of the revolution that I want to see people do. I have to realize that everything doesn't have to be, you know, okay, now we're going to run out in the street and we're going to be angry and we're going to do this, although we have to do all of that work of being angry and claiming it. But the other thing is we get to write love stories. We get to write family stories. We get to write, you know, mama and daddy and how we couldn't make them understand. And then they finally did and how we fell in love and that person helped us be better and we helped them be better or they didn't, they were worse and they made us worse. But tell the stories, I think, that that um, keeps you grounded in it even on those days when you feel like, why are we doing this? Because the reason is we all had a moment in the theater when we felt transformed. or We wouldn't be sitting up here trying to make a living at it now. We all had that moment where we said, oh, you know, that's me. That's all about what I know to be true in this world. And then we've been trying to make that happen for other people and continue to make that happen for ourselves. And I think that's valuable life's work as valuable as any other work you could choose because it gets you closer to the truth of what it means to be human. And that's such an amazing, miraculous thing to actually even glimpse it. You know, what does it mean to be a fully realized human being that we can spend 20 lifetimes trying to get to the answer to that question and we would get a little closer and a little closer and it's worth it because it's every day. Freedom is a constant struggle. Enlightenment is a constant struggle. You know, learning to be a good artist is a constant struggle. But that's what we're here to do. You know, that's great work. That's that's good work. And we, we're doing it because we believe in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> I'll have one thing, um, which is not a follow up to that. But one thing I'll do. Um, about this this notion of the echo chamber, and I've definitely felt that before. I feel that quite often, and the, and the thing that 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 I have to remind myself is that because I say a lot of the same stuff a lot of the time when I speak on these panels, when I engage with students, but it's um it, for me it's like if if one thing that I that I'm saying reaches one new person each time I speak, then I don't care about the echo chamber. So I have to remind myself that you know that that something that I'm going to say will reach someone new every time that I have the opportunity to share my voice. So I try to lean into that. I think something that I'm learning, even in this moment, and since Brandon and I have been working with the commissary since March or so, since no, 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 June, July, June, July, when, um, when we started, when we joined them, it sounds really simple, but open your mouth. Open your mouth, whether that means do your art, open your mouth and whatever, whatever that is that's on you to do, whether it means have a conversation with like-minded people so you can move forward or find a way to move forward, whether it means talking to someone who is not like-minded so that you can help open up a dialogue. It's all like nothing will be solved if we keep our mouths closed, if we stay silent, right? Um, it's just, it sounds like a simple thing, but it, I know it can be challenging because when you open your mouth, you're opening your heart in a way, right? But there's no other way, like Pearl said, or like Kathleen said today, she said the split, a split is a process. The process, like that, the struggle is a process. That's 
the workings of that's life is that is going to happen. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the life's work. The struggle is part of it. Um, and we can accept that in a gracious way and not in a, um, you know, you know, it don't have to be that, you know, and when it is that I call Pearl Clay and I say, I don't know what to do. And I, ha and I just, I have to just say that Pearl, I just, I cannot tell you, you are a gem of a human. I didn't know what to do after Trump got elected. I said, how can I open my mouth? What am I going to do? What is art? What is art? What is it even for? And she said, do it. That's what you do. You love and you do your work. You keep going. He's not going to, he ain't going to be here ever. Yeah. You got to keep going. Yeah. And we need that. But, but it only happened because I was able, I had the courage to say, I'm lost. I'm hurt. I'm sad. I'm, and reach out and open your mouth. Yeah. And on that note, we should remind everybody that tonight, um, we are going to have another video um, drop of episode four of uh, our commissary work mm -hmm. with the Vineyard. Um, and it's, all, it's going to do just that. Uh, it's going to feature Kyle Beltran, uh, Yoni, uh, uh, Gabby Yehu, T.L. Thompson, and um, they're doing the, the words of Barry Rustin. Um, yeah. So you don't want to miss that. And then uh, Tuesday, uh, we have the second, uh, fifth episode will be airing, and that's at both are both are at eight thirty. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you can go Thursday is another open rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So look, you can just keep your uh, channel tuned to the Vineyard Theater and get all all the goodness all for the whole week. And it is good, like it really is. Yeah, it's you know, and I know I, maybe about ten more minutes if we can have it because I want to pose this question. It might be opening up. You know something uh, bigger than we can handle at this moment, but I I need it for myself, so I'm gonna be selfish. Theater will come back. It will come back. We will be in a space, and and all of us artists who are who have been uh, working in predominantly white institutions, right? I think it, there's a consensus that a radical change is necessary, and it is coming when that theater does come up. Pearl, you talked about relationships and 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 being at the heart of this work in, in activism and the relationships that we make of you know, people of like mind, right? And we all have had relationships with people inside these uh, predominantly white institutions, right? Uh, which can sometimes be uh, a scary thing to navigate, you know, because these are honest real relationships as well with some of these institutions, in fact. So my question for you is, did, do you have any, any offerings uh, as we move forward, when theater comes back in and taking the work that we're doing now, taking the the uh, I mean the, the radical thoughts, the ideas, the movement, this 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 wind that's at our backs now. So as we step into whatever this new thing in theater is going to be, do you have any offerings and talking about those relationships for for black artists or BIPOC artists going back into these white spaces in this in, in the new whatever it is that it will be? Do you have any offerings, anyone? I think one of the things is going to be not allowing the conversation to be hijacked into white fragility or how white people are having a hard time with this moment or how hard it is to be a white person when you're confronted by a black person. That a lot of that is work that they're going to have to do. And we are going to have to keep pointing out things to them, but we have to walk that line between trying to do their work for them. And sometimes when I hear these discussions where it's like, OK, now the, the, the white people in the group are trying to make it all about them again. And it's like, no, no, we're not talking about you right now. We're talking about me. We're talking about us. We're not talking about you. And if it makes you cry, it makes you cry. You know, when I first started working at the Alliance, our artistic director, is Susan Booth, who is a wonderful, progressive white woman. And I said to her, I'm a little nervous about coming to work here because I've been working in black institutions and I'm going to tell you the truth about every single thing. And there's only one rule. You have to also tell me the truth and you can't cry. No matter what I say, you cannot cry because that's what white women often do. They cry and then the, the conversation changes to comforting them as opposed to continuing the righteous wrath of the black woman. So Susan swore to me she would never cry. And once I said it to her, she started seeing it in places. She would be at a conference where that happened. She would see it in a discussion where that happened. And she could really check herself about that 
trying to make the discussion be all about her and make the discussion be now my feelings are hurt. And I think that's part of what we're going to have to deal with when these theaters reopen up because people are going to be like, okay, we're back. All that stuff we said and all those pledges we took, well, we got to fill these seats right now. So we can't talk about your stuff anymore. And we have to keep saying, no, it's our stuff. It's mm. all of us together. Oh, so awesome. yes, you're going to have to talk about it. And I think the, the main thing in all these conversations is you must tell these people the truth always. And you don't have to tell them in a mean way and say, let me tell you all about your sorry self. You can just tell them the truth because many times they are ignorant. They think they are really smart people. But when it comes to these questions that, that we're so well-versed in, they're really ignorant. So assume ignorance as opposed to malice mm -hmm. and correct it, but don't do missionary work. You know, in the feminist movement, I, I got to a place where I would give the men that I was talking to, interested in, I would give them a book list and say, no, you have to understand what I'm talking about in terms of feminism. And then maybe we can go out, but you gotta read these books. Hey. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? And I was very serious. And yes. only one man in all of my courtship moments read those books and I married him. That would be Z. Y'all know Z. That's right, because he did the work. He wasn't looking for me to tell him about feminism. He was prepared to do that work. And that's what we have to carry over into our discussions about race and about gender and about who we are in the fullness of who we are to say, no, no, I'm not doing missionary work. You have to do that. You must do it. You know, you must go into your community and tell me why so many white women voted for Donald Trump when 98% of the black women in my neighborhood voted for the Democrat. So they have a lot of work to do and they would rather us do it for them, but we don't have time. We have our own work to do. So don't take it on when it comes to you as something that's your job. Always say to yourself, is this missionary work or is this really my job? Mm -hmm. And if it's missionary work, give them a book list, tell them they need to read something and then they can come back and talk to you later. You know, tell them, refer them to a program where they can hear someone say the words of Kathleen Cleaver or James Baldwin and say, now come back and talk to me. But no, I'm not doing the reading for you. Read the books. It's not mysterious what it feels like to be an oppressed person in America. There's so many books about it by all of us. Read the books, do their work and don't feel like we have to do it for them because there's going to be a lot of that when these theaters reopen and we have to protect ourselves and continue to speak the truth always. And look, they can watch this video. It's there you go. <laughs> Any other offerings? Queen Jean? Yes. I was gonna do a quick one. Um, you know, I think it is so, for all that, I mean, I am actually feeling healed in this conversation. Thank you. Truly, truly, thank you, thank you, thank you. I. Um, it's something that I think, I'll be honest, this is terrible to say, but you know, everyone's like, oh my God, like, we can't wait to go back. We can't wait to go back. And I'm like, I'm not in no rush. I'll be honest. I'm not in, in, in a rush to get back. Rush to get back to what? Uh, are people really going to be able to be open? Are people going to really be willing to relinquish their power? so that a black woman can hold space, so that a black woman can lead, so that a black woman can be telling y'all, giving instruction. Will you actually be receptive to that? And I think the reality is, well, we all know the reality. But I think for me, I'm not actually personally here to issue people, white people citations, right? Just do better, do better. I mean, I don't think that we need apologies. Um, if you've said something out of turn, we will acknowledge it, but then we're moving on. Um, I think so many times that it feels like uh, we have to be safe, we have to be guarded. We have always felt that because we didn't want to not get hired again, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, well, let me just, you know, we absorb all of these things, right, in order to still get the work done, mm -hmm. in order to still earn a living, in order to still get our work showcased. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, what I'm interested in or any offerings would be that, um, similar to Pearl, that the truth is imperative, the truth is centered. We are just going to be centering Black people moving forward, right? We don't need an excuse to do it. We don't need another Black brother killed to do it, right? We don't need a month that's dedicated to do it. It should just be part of our narrative moving forward. And I just ask, and I'm demanding, actually, I'm demanding that Black trans stories are part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. Right, because we've been integral to this culture, so you're not gonna skip out on us now. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cody, yes. Um, I just want to build on what both Pearl and Queen was saying, that um, the, what I would offer to people, especially in this time of, of, of not working, in this time of self-discovery, to find out what their voice is and find out where their power lies. So when we go back to this room, in their power and stand in their voice. Um, uh, and and in, the, in that, you know, take space, make space. Take as much space mm -hmm. as you need, but make space for the next person to come along with you. Because we're only going to get further ahead by bringing people with us. So yeah. I always say take space, make space. That's that's what I'll offer us. What else can we say? <laughs> I mean, a lot probably. Yeah, I'm sure. With these brilliant minds, we can yes. say a whole heck of a lot. Yeah, all night. I can listen to y'all all night. But I know what I can say is thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you and I love you all. I love you for you taking the time to bless us. I love you all watching, taking the time to grow and get bigger. Cause we need to get big y'all. We got to be big, you know? So thank you, we love you. We just so appreciate you. And we in solidarity with you. Onward my people, onward. Mm -hmm. So check out the Vineyard Theater's website for more programming. Uh, check out the commissary, what we're doing. You can follow us on all social media platforms. Instagram, Twitter. Uh, I don't know if we get a little uh, graphic at the bottom, but uh, maybe we can in post. I don't know. Do we have post? Who knows? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Well, we got Google. Google. Google, Google the commissary. Google video theater. And before we go, is there anything that any of y'all, would y'all like to let anybody know about that you're doing or you want us to be aware of before we go? Because I would be remiss without doing that. Yes. I just want to say, if there's anyone watching who has the means and the and the and they want to donate to the scholarship program that I've created, uh, you can go to my website, CodyRenard.com/scholarships. We are accepting all donations. If you know people who would like to come on as sponsors, they can email me, and I would love to chat about that. If you know students who would be great for this program, please have them apply or please spread the word. Um, we really are just trying to get the word out right now. Thank you, brother Cody. Yeah, thank you. Hi, hey fam, uh, family, because y'all are my family yes, now. Uh, <laughs> I would love to uh, just share uh, as an offering, but as an invitation, really, uh, to check out blacktransliberation.com. Uh, and that is an organization that uh, I founded, but we are working toward ratifying the statistic that black trans people, um, that, their, that their life expectancy is 35. And the reality is, is that actually a lot of our family members, our siblings, aren't even living past 25. There was a young lady in Louisiana, in Shreveport, who was killed on uh, the 7th. And she was just 20 years old. She had not been 20 for 20 days. So for me, this is a, for me, it's a state of emergency mm -hmm. that uh, our own family members are being killed. And ain't no one talking about it. Mm. So I'm not done talking. I'm not done fighting. I will not be done until trans, black trans women are privileged, until black trans women have power, until black trans women are even in the White House. And that's all. Thank you. Ms. Clegg. I love y'all so much. This was like the best possible way to spend this Sunday evening. Um, I feel love for y'all. I feel protective of you. Um, and I just want you to know that we are, are looking from a few years ahead of you um, at what you're doing. And it just it makes my heart so full to see what you all are doing. And if you ever doubt that this is the work you're supposed to be doing, don't. This is the work you're supposed to be doing. And I just am so grateful for you all for including me in this discussion. And I say stay safe, stay strong and be very bold, be very bold. Um, I could not love y'all more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We'll leave it there. We'll leave, we'll leave it. it there. Thank you all for watching. Till next time, my yes. friends. <laughs>